Hi, this is Dennis with Cybercraft. Today we're gonna to be doing a risk register. A risk register is a list of potential risks to your organization, and it includes information about the probability of the risk, uh, the impact, the potential cost, and what you can do, your response strategy, and how that response strategy, how much that will cost, and how that could address the risk itself. So it can be very useful to have a risk register, especially as your organization gains maturity and becomes more, more established. If you've seen risk happen or you've seen events, uh, threats to your organization happen often, or uh, you suspect that you're at increased threat, so maybe you're in a high crime area, so there's a, a threat of employees having their laptop stolen, for example, or maybe you are a very popular public-facing company, so there's a high threat to your web server because of your popularity. Uh, having Understanding your threats is very important, and a risk register can help you categorize those threats and then strategize and develop ways to respond to those. So here we have a risk register template, and there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing these. There's multiple templates you might see. This is just a simple one. And let's go ahead and, and take a moment and fill some of these out here. So first, we have a web server malfunction. And what we want to do is we want to assign this risk to a risk owner, somebody who is ultimately responsible if this happens. So with a web server, let's just say that's going to be the CISO. And honestly, with most of these, it's probably going to be the CISO, except I'd say this one, which would probably be the HR director or HR manager. But the rest of these should be owned by the CISO. If you have a CISO, maybe you have a CTO and a CISO, in which case I'd say uh, the CTO, Chief Technology Officer, would be responsible for these two. Ransomware attack would be CISO. Stolen laptop would be CISO. Server admin leaving the company would probably either be CISO or maybe HR director. I think that would be a pretty good strategy. And, and this is going to be decided by senior leadership within the organization. So we would describe this, the web server malfunctioning. Uh, web server is taken offline due to a improperly configured patch, for example. All right, so we'll put that there. Let's expand that and let's select a probability for this. You can categorize these risks uh, if you have a category that you have in mind for your organization, but let's go ahead and, and do a probability here. I'm gonna skip that for now. Probability, low, moderate, or high. I'd say that's moderate, unless we're a very popular company. So maybe we have an improperly configured patch. I'd say there's a moderate risk there. Now maybe it depends, the impact will depend on how reliant you are on your web server. So if your organization relies on like online sales, if it's maybe a clothing store that uh, people order clothing directly off the website and that's how you make all of your business, then that's gonna be a high impact. If you're just a, um, yeah, if you're just maybe like a air conditioning company and your primary business is made by having your employees go and do service calls to different office buildings, maybe having your website offline wouldn't have as big of an impact. That might be low. Uh, so let's say this is a tech company that does like IT services. So for them, I think the reputational impact would have to be considered. And we're gonna go ahead and I think select moderate for that uh, because we can count, factor in that reputational hit. You know, IT company shouldn't have their website be rendered offline. So of course here what we're doing is we're doing a qualitative assessment as opposed to a quantitative assessment. A quantitative assessment might be incorporated into a risk register as well, where you would calculate actual dollar amounts and probability numbers. Now we could estimate a cost, and that cost should include not only the cost of the web server, but also the cost of the work hours it's going to take and the number of people who need to work on that web server uh, that needs to be factored in also. When I used to work as a government contractor, one of the agencies I worked for within Department of Homeland Security had a calculation tool that we would use for all of the, all of the potential 
uh, threats or all of our poems or plans of action and milestones. We had to calculate out the cost of remediation, of fixing those. And it was through this tool. It included you know, job description, uh, the type of person, in what role that needed to fix the issue. So that had to be factored in at their hourly rate for X number of hours. We had to factor that in. So let's just estimate this cost. Let's say, you know, web server, maybe we have $20,000 and maybe it's going to take a couple days worth of work. So let's just be, let's just make it 21,000. Just a general guess there. Now our risk response is going to be one of four things, except mitigate, transfer, or avoid. If we're going to accept the risk, that means we're not going to, um, we're going to just accept that this is a possibility and not respond to it in any way. Now we can also, once we mitigated it, we would accept what's known as the residual risk, which is the risk after mitigation, but our risk response would still be mitigate. So mitigate is to lessen, either lessen the impact or decrease the likelihood of this happening. One way we can do this is, let's say mitigate, is to maybe install a server cluster. So let's say, let me see the rest of this. So we're install a install a server cluster. So if our one web server goes down, we have another web server that spins up and takes its place. Our response triggers sometimes use, I'm gonna avoid it, or I'm gonna delete it from this. And remember, when you use a risk register template like this, you wanna make it your own, you really wanna internalize it. So if you don't wanna have certain aspects of it, that's fine, just make it relevant for your organization. The cost of response, if we installed a server cluster, uh, so this would be a yearly cost of the impact. I'd say a server cluster would essentially be a whole nother web server. Now, so we'd probably, to install a whole nother web server, we'd probably want to pick that 21,000 again. One thing we did not factor in, now you take a look at this, you might be thinking, well, do we want to have this response if it's going to cost the same as the impact? It's a great question. And what we did not factor in with the impact, we just factored in the, the server price and the manpower. One thing that is often left out is the reputational impact. How much lost business is this going to cost us? Now that's a great question and that's something that's very difficult to, to measure. So we can estimate that and let's say this, we expect that to lose us one contract a year, maybe that each contract averages about $40,000. So let's bump that number up to 61,000. We, we're gonna lose one contract if our website goes down and we can take that reputational hit. Okay, so we have that. And oftentimes you'd see these color coded. So moderate usually is color coded as orange, low is green, red is high. We're gonna color code those. Our response is to mitigate, our cost of impact, 61,000. Cost response, 21,000. The response cost should usually be less than the cost of the impact. It should always really be less. You don't wanna be spending more on your response than you are on what it costs uh, to have that loss. You don't wanna put a $100 lock or a, like a $300 lock on a $100 bicycle. It used to be like a $100 lock on like a $50 bicycle, but now we have rampant inflation, so we gotta up those numbers. <laughs> And even $100 is pretty cheap for a bicycle. Okay, so a response impact, which is basically, eh, I'm gonna delete that too. It's, we're just gonna keep it right here. So response description, cost response, cost of impact. And then risk category, we can say, we can categorize it to these one if we want these two, but I'm just gonna take that out. We're gonna keep this real simple. So this is gonna be our strategy there. So web servers taken offline, probability, impact, cost of impact, cost response. Now, there's other examples of risk registers. If you look, uh, for example, if you take a, our SISM class, you'll get this risk register example from ISACA, which is very good, which includes dates of assessments, risk categories, strategic risks, project risks, program risks, and then it includes a quantitative uh, portion to it. So that's 
It's an excellent risk register example, and you get this is included as part of the comp or the uh, ISACA SISM material. So if you're looking to get your SISM uh, certification, you get that as far as the official materials. But anyway, let's go through. Let's do a couple of these. So next one here, we have a fire in the data center. Uh, let's go ahead and go down to employee misses training. Okay, so employee misses annual cybersecurity awareness training. Okay, now that's going to potentially lead to an increase in cyber threat. The probability of this happening is pretty high, right? I would say that's pretty high. That somebody misses training, that happens quite frequently. I'd say the impact is probably fairly low. Having somebody miss training, while training is important, I don't think that that would on its own lead to a major cost. So the cost of this, it would cost, uh, there's a potential increased threat for insider threats. So we have to factor that in. But we also have you know, the cost of coordinating another training session, which might take maybe the training lasts an hour or two hours. So we can, let's estimate this at about 5,000, I'd say. 5,000 would be maybe for the time spent to coordinate the training and then also for the potential increase threat of having that employee go without training, maybe that might lead to an increase in insider threat. Now you could be, now if there is a potential for insider threat, you might want to consider this number a lot higher. And you might want to consider the impact a lot higher because most attacks, most ransomware attacks, major leaks, uh, major cybersecurity breaches happen through social engineering. So we can consider the cost of the impact for training much higher. And it might not be apparent to the employee. It won't be apparent usually to the employee who missed the training. But as a cybersecurity professional, we need to consider that. It might not even be, uh, it might not even be apparent to the HR manager, but it's something that needs to be, rec uh, needs to be recognized. So we might actually say that this, the cost of somebody missing training, instead of 5,000, maybe we say 60,000 because a potential security breach or even maybe a security breach costs on average 100,000. And if an employee is missing training, they're increasing our likelihood of having a security breach. So we could say that that's 100,000 and then the impact would be at least moderate. So we'd put moderate there. Now our response to that is to discipline the employee. I mean, really, we have to have that into our policy. Uh, and the cost response shouldn't be very much. So the cost response is probably about like a thousand, uh, just some extra time spent coaching that employee and even writing that into the policy to ensure that employees understand if they miss training, then they could be reprimanded some way. And a response there, I'd say, would be to mitigate that uh, by discipline employee and then retraining the employee. So we're going to have the, the employee go through the training. Okay, now we have two here that are mitigate. What about something like a fire in the data center? Now this is something that we can have mitigation and we can have uh, transfer responses. So let's pick an example of the transfer response. I'm going to go ahead and select transfer there. And the description, a fire breaks out in the data center, destroying several servers. Now we probably want to have a couple different responses here. Okay, the probability of this, I say moderate, now, of course, we want to have fire suppression, which would be a way to mitigate the risk. And the impact would be high. I, I would definitely say high there. The cost of the impact, if we've lost our servers, we have the downtime from the servers going offline, including the web server. Uh, so it has to, it would include the impact of the web server essentially as well. Maybe we'd say this is going to be 500,000. So $500,000 potential impact, 
And we could choose to have fire insurance or cyber risk insurance. Insurance is a way that we would transfer our risk, okay? And that insurance might only cost us 6,000 per year. spelling that's definitely important when you're filling out these risk registers okay so we have mitigate transfer now avoiding a risk would mean that we're avoiding the business process altogether okay so let's see server admin leaves company I don't see that that would be a way we can avoid it let's add a new one here and let's say um, that we've so when we avoid risk, we want to avoid an entire business process. So maybe we can have a business process of door-to-door -door IT services. So where we drive to a location and we provide IT services on location, on demand for small businesses. Okay, and then we can have maybe IT door-to-door -door truck breaks down. So maybe we have a, a truck or something that we have in the organization that we use to drive our people to various businesses to do IT services. So if we don't want to deal with a truck breaking down, I'm going to assign that to the CTO, then what we can do is we can avoid the risk. If we avoid the risk, we can basically uh, refrain from doing that door-to-door -door service. So that's how we would we would admit it, we would avoid that risk essentially because we would not be participating at all in the business process of having that door-to-door -door IT service. So never think that you're avoiding a risk by putting in a security control. You can only avoid a risk by not participating in a business process whatsoever. So I hope that makes sense. We have mitigate transfer, and then we may have accept here, and that would probably be most relevant for employee stolen laptop. We can choose to accept the risk that a laptop could be stolen. Then in which case we would not put any type of response, or say for a laptop stolen, we can mitigate it by doing uh, full disk encryption. And that might cost maybe $500 per laptop. Probably not even that. And that makes it so that if the laptop's stolen, the data is stolen in encrypted form. So I hope this helps understand these, these processes. I think stolen laptop probably moderate with a impact of low. Door door truck breaks down, moderate, moderate. And it helps to fill these out on your own uh, to better conceptualize them. It can be hard to conceptualize some of these terms without actually working through one. If you've ever done one of these before, that can be pretty difficult to understand truly what a risk register is, but this is it. Usually just like some Excel sheet uh, or a document. And usually key stakeholders are gonna approve of the risk register. They're going to, you're gonna have and gather feedback from key stakeholders within the organization, and then individuals in charge, the risk owners, and those who are actually working the data center, working with the web servers, to determine the probability impact and the cost. So you wanna gather it, feedback from a lot of different people within your organization to make sure this is accurate. But I hope this is helpful to learn more about a risk register. And thanks so much for joining. If you are looking for cybersecurity training courses, including ISACA, CISA, CISM, and CRISC, or any of the CompTIA, EC Council, any certification at all, check the link in the description. Visit cybercrafttrain.com. Be happy to get you certified. Thanks so much. Hope you have a great day.